This is William Moberly with the Americans in Wartime Museum conducting an interview with Ren Gade on the 9th of March 2020 at St. Matthew's United Methodist Church. So Ren, um, we're interested in hearing about how you came to be in the military. What were the influences and what kind of, uh, uh, any family experience with, with veterans, that kind of thing? Uh, yes, there was, Bill. There's actually, a, I can say, a fairly extensive history. Uh, my dad was post the Korean War era, um, Army Occupation Forces in Germany. I think that was, for him, probably the highlight of his life. Mm. Um, rose to the rank of PFC, I think. And uh, 1949 to 50, no, 50 to 53, I think it was. Um, and then my oldest brother is a retired now uh, career non-commissioned officer. And uh, he did two tours of Vietnam. And uh, somebody, there's a 10 year age gap between us, somebody I've always you know, really looked up to. Hmm. What did your dad do in the, in the Army? Uh, so we grew up in a uh, part, of, part of Wisconsin that is very um, German in orientation. Hmm. Um, by way of background history, people came from Germany there. Uh, so he spoke German, he could ski. Um, so he was in, believe it or not, the ski patrol. Um, he was a uh, surveyor, uh, spent part of his time in Italy, but uh, he has great pictures, or he had great pictures of uh, him and the, you know, the eagle's nest and stuff like that and skiing and hmm. so, yeah, rough duty. Yeah, sounds good. So how did you get in the military? What happened there? Well, from, I think, fourth grade on, I wanted to be an attorney. I wanted to be a trial attorney. Uh, I talked to my oldest brother, the NCO that I had just mentioned, and he said, you know, hey, I've come across these guys called JAGs that try a lot of cases. You ought to look into it. I was uh, in between my undergraduate and uh, law school, uh, starting law school, and I, I did look into it. And um, I thought, you know, hey, this is this sounds great. Trying a lot of cases right out of the, right out of the shoot would be fantastic. And um, so I looked into going into ROTC while in law school. As far as I know, I was the first one to go through ROTC, the two-year program, um, in law school. So I did ROTC my uh, 1L, my 2L year. Um, wasn't funded, unfortunately, at the time. Now apparently it's a pretty well-established uh, thing to do. It wasn't at the time. So I was uh, uh, working full-time, two jobs, law school and ROTC. Where were you going to school? for? Uh, at Drake University. Drake. Okay. And uh, so that was, that was my interest. And um, so I was commissioned as a field artillery officer. And um, luckily I was uh, selected for the JAG Corps. Otherwise I would have been, you know, pulling lanyards someplace, someplace. And uh, uh, so I went or came into the Army as a judge advocate. 1985, I wore cross cannons exactly twice. Hmm. So how, how, how did that happen? I mean, you were in law school, ROTC, they knew what your background was, and you end up in the artillery. Is that the Army way? So, um, actually, that was selection. So combat arms um, are for those who, who did well, and I was number two in my, in my, two of my uh, battalion, I guess it was. And uh, the number one guy was actually the uh, top cadet in ROTC that year. And uh, Tony Holm was also a Vietnam vet. And um, so my PMS, my professor of military science, was a field artillery officer, still in contact with him. And uh, magically enough, I ended up as a artillery officer, at least commissioned as an artillery officer. So the JAG thing wasn't a, a, a contract or a guarantee thing? Oh, no, not at all. Um, not at all. In fact, um, I, was, I was sweating it because I didn't do all that well in law school. And I thought I bombed the interviews. The interviews, as I've later learned, are incredibly important uh, for a session. Um, but I was selected nonetheless. And uh, so, yeah. Very good. Now, you did your basic work while in ROTC in the summers, or how did that work? Yeah, I went out to Fort Lewis, Washington for, actually not uh, basic, it was for ROTC advance camp because it's a two year. So in between my, what it would have been a junior and senior, or 1L and 2L year, 
Uh, then went to Fort Lewis, Washington for the uh, ROTC advance camp. Okay. So when you came into the military, where did you go? You go to OCS or? No. Um, so I took a one-year ed delay for my third year of law school. Um, and then I received orders to report to Fort Dix, New Jersey. I was there for about a month before my basic course in Charlottesville started. And that's a 10 month or 10 and a half month academic year uh, basic course. Um, so I don't know if you know this or not, but the Army JAG School is right on the campus of the University of Virginia. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So they have a whole, a whole course they put you through before you become a military lawyer. I assume there's a lot of military law uh, you know, that you study and kind of shift gears away from the civilian side? It is. It is uh, heavily focused on, on military law, um, unique aspects of, of administrative law that you know, pertain only to, to uniform services. Uh, but then it's also um, a familiarization with everything that we, you would be expected to confront as a new attorney at an Army post across, across the world. Everything from labor law to environmental law, um, like I said, administrative law, legal assistance, you know, helping soldiers out with wills, bars of attorneys, you know, landlord-tenant disputes, all of that. Cool. What was it like being in a military-based school on a Virginia Public University campus during that time? That must have been an interesting ride. So, actually, that, that was... Uh, that's not so much a big a deal at all. UVA uh, has been a good host for the JAG school since right after World War II. Uh, so the JAG school is actually in a lease facility um, on the north grounds of the University of Virginia. They're pretty well accustomed to that, so it wasn't any big deal at all. In our class, so just for understanding, there are about a third were FLEP officers, funded legal education program officers, so people who had been in other um, branches then were, had funded legal education, came in about a third um, ROTC, and then the other third or 40 percent actually were direct commissions, so they had no familiarity with, uh, with the military at all. And really for them it was, you know, how to wear a uniform, you know, how to get a proper haircut, all that type of stuff. Mm. Um, so, go back to your question, actually where it stood out more was at Drake, um, you're walking across campus in uniform for our for classes, um, smaller campus, military um, had been kicked off campus uh, during the 60s and that had just recently come back. I think that in my I think it was a company there. Yeah, it was an ROTC company, pretty pretty small. Um, we were the maybe the third, one of the first classes back on after they had allowed ROTC back on campus. So that was that was a little bit odd for people to see people in in uh, army uniforms. There's only an army ROTC, none of the other services represented. So that was a little bit odd for people to see. So I'm trying to think of the atmosphere back in that time period. It was post-Vietnam by a, by a while. Correct. So, what? so it wasn't necessarily anti-military. It was just a curiosity, to say the least. And certainly a curiosity for my law school classmates, um, with the exception of one, two, or three had no military background or whatever. Um, one of my law school classmates uh, ended up being, um, uh, who was also in the in RTC as well, not at Drake, but at another school, uh, ended up being in my basic course, and uh, still lifelong friends with him hmm. in his family. Yeah. Very cool. So they put you through a bunch of training. You went um, from undergrad to graduate school, and did the ROTC thing. What do they do with brand new graduates from the basic school? What what, what happens? Well, generally, they put them into legal assistance or administrative law. Um, it just so happened that at that time, Fort Dix was a, a basic in AIT. It was a, a place for young soldiers. There was an opening in the trial defense service. So um, soldiers get in trouble. You're the public defender, essentially. Mm -hmm. 
and I ended up spending over four years uh, doing that, and it was uh, that was great fun. So, by way of achieving what you want to achieve, try a lot of cases right out of the get go. Mm -hmm. That was great fun. Yeah, that was the kind of law you had been interested in initially, right? That had been, yes. So I did everything from uh, capital murder cases, uh, rapes, uh, disobedience, AWOLs, um, you name it, all of that. Classified cases, too, in my head. Really? In fact, that's how I got my clearance initially. Interesting. In fact, you might remember this. Uh, BSI Yellowford. So the Army established a uh, clandestine unit to do clandestine counterintelligence work um, around the world. They were remarkably successful. This is all out now. They um, bugged Noriega's car, um, embassy. Um, they were very successful in a number of different places in the world. Hmm. And the um, two senior officers got in trouble for We'll say travel fraud, mm. and um, so that involved getting into exactly how they did their their business, which 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 took a, a top secret clearance, and that was um, you know two years out of law school. That was pretty fun stuff. Yeah, that's it's uh, one of those breaks that uh, kind of sets your path for the future, doesn't it? It does, as a yeah. matter of fact. Indeed. So um, you did this at Fort Dix for four years, you say? Uh, over four years, over four, four, years. four and a half years, something like that. Yeah. Okay. And then what kind of things did they move you to? Uh, then I went to, that's where I met my wife, is at Fort Dix. She was an Army officer there, too. Okay. And um, so we went to, she got out of the Army, and we went to uh, Washington, D.C., and I did uh, appellate defense work there. So the soldiers that are represented at trial were now convicted. And I represented them in appellate courts all the way up to uh, the Supreme Court. Never argued a case at the Supreme Court, but uh, um, wrote, I don't know, a number of cases for certiorari for the, for the Supreme Court to take on a couple, couple more death penalty cases. And, mm. Yeah. Wow. Yep. So where were you assigned uh, in the D.C. area? So... You remember over on Columbia Pike, there was the NASIF building? Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, so that was the original place. Was there for, gosh, about a year and a half. I went and did uh, more trial work. Civil litigation this time, so um, this was military personnel. That was the time of Desert Shield, Desert Storm. So we did everything from uh, promotion boards that people um, alleged had gone wrong. They tried to do uh, class action lawsuits about how promotion boards are run. Um, and probably most effectively, uh, myself and another officer set up essentially a, a uh, temporary restraining order defense shop. So what was happening is a number of people were refusing to report. Um, or we're going AWOL. And um, the, if you remember the newspapers at the time, those, those were kind of cause celeb. And uh, so myself and one person, uh, actually two other people, three people total, we went um, around the United States uh, opposing the temporary restraining orders and the preliminary injunctions. Uh, so what would typically happen is um, we would, in fact, in all circumstances, we won uh, the motion and the person was uh, usually put in handcuffs um, in the courthouse and let out by U.S. Marshals. And they were taken back to? And they were taken back to wherever they were supposed to go. I see. Yeah. I see. And when was that? That was in the ramp up time? Or? That was, that was uh, 90, 91, 90, 91. It was wrap up time, but also during it as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so what, what was the environment like back then um, during that period of time? Things were very tense, of course. Tense, yes. Quite a division in the American public, at least initially. No blood for oil, if you remember. Um, and then, of course, the resounding victory has a way of 
putting all of that mm -hmm. aside. Mm -hmm. what, what did you see post um, Desert Storm? Were there any unusual case loads that came up as a result of that at the opposite end? No, there weren't, actually. All those cases, all those uh, folks who had opposed before um, largely went away. When I say they went away, I mean that their opposition went away. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody loves a winner, right? Everybody loves a winner. Mm -hmm. And that was such a resounding victory. Um, you know, that was, in, by, certainly by way of comparison to what happened afterwards, you know, in the years afterwards, that was incredibly quick, incredibly quick. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, the uh, decision not to invade Iraq at that time certainly played into that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's see. So, um, prior to Desert uh, Shield and Desert Storm, we had some other little brush war things going on and island invasions, things like that. What do you remember about that era? Was there anything that affected your world from that time period? Um, not directly, because at that time I was, in, I was really focused on um, litigation and, and being God's gift to you know, being a litigator, mm -hmm. being you know, wholly focused on, on that uh, to the point where I had delayed my grad course. So after I left, mil left the military personnel branch, I went to do um, tort branch. So that's everything from you know, slip and falls in the commissary to what I spent most of my time on, which was um, medical malpractice cases. And my jurisdiction was um, basically the East Coast. And uh, so, um, good news and bad news with that. In that, mm -hmm. after doing a couple of years of that, I said, you know, this isn't as enjoyable as I mm -hmm. really liked. You know, uh, opposing and running through depositions hour after hour wasn't wasn't a, that all interesting to me. In the civil litigation that is. Um, but I still harbored hopes of being a uh, criminal assistant United States attorney. And I, uh, I was a finalist in a number of different places. Hmm. I was selected after I reported my grad course. Wow. And, um, and then uh, the, the judge of a general in the Army at the time said, uh, sorry, um, you've already reported and we have better plans for you. And that was another circumstance that was just, I said, fortuitous, because I really enjoyed what happened after that. So what happened after that? Um, great mentors uh, mentored me, and they said, you know, I understand what you wanted to do before, but we have uh, thoughts that you would be a great uh, leader and, and manager uh, in more of the operational realm. And uh, so they literally uh, put their arm around me and said, um, I understand that you put your wish list in, which is used as an example, um, but all the places that you're thinking about going have, uh, you're too concerned about the quality of life. You need to go to Fort Bragg. And um, magically enough, I ended up at Fort Bragg, or we ended up at Fort Bragg because we had a, uh, our oldest uh, child at the time. And uh, we spent eight years there? Yeah, eight years there, back and forth. And it was a great time. Great what people. kinds of work were you doing there that was so good? Um, well, the first job, um, so I had to go to airborne school, of course, to, to go to the units at Fort Bragg. So I went to uh, airborne school as a, as a major then. And um, first job there, I was the chief of civil law. So that was everything from labor relations to contract and fiscal. Um, and then where I spent almost all of my time was on um, endangered species. Fort Bragg has this thing called the Red Caucasian Woodpecker. Um, and so it received an incredible amount of attention from state uh, and Fish and Wildlife Service regulators. And um, I established called something called the uh, Operational and Fort Bragg Operations and Endangered Species Council. So literally all of the operators, people who ran the place, um, and the biologists got together um, and uh, duked it out literally sometimes. It was almost to fisticuffs mm. about how to put an endangered species management plan together. And the purpose behind that was um, basically to be able to not shut, not shut down training areas 
um, establish a responsible endangered species recovery plan um, and uh, get approval to do it. So we did all that and then 10 years later after I had left uh, we actually recovered the species. It's, uh, it's a growing place for endangered species. Now, of course, the birds probably chose the most dangerous portions of the base to do their nesting and uh, well, and, where explosions and, and, of things are going off, or how did that work? Actually, that is part of it, yeah. yeah. Um, so, um, unexploited ordnance areas, uh, which were um, not trafficked by humans, were one of the recovery sites, um, huge recovery sites. And then also we put in reasonable restrictions on what soldiers could and could not do. If you identified a bird and a, and a nesting bird, uh, then essentially a smaller area we were able to convince the Fish and Wildlife Service rather than shutting down whole areas, uh, reasonable restrictions where you could uh, move through most of the training at night, so move through an area, um, you know, without you know damaging the the, the tree, um, and it actually worked. Like I said, the species thrived. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. So back to your airborne training. That was a, an actual requirement if you were stationed there? To be in an airborne unit. Um, and so the units I was with are 18th Airborne Corps first and then 82nd, I flip flop between the two. Um, yeah, those are airborne units. And so, yeah, you're required to jump out of a Blair airplane. What did you think of that? I thought it was a blast. I'm not a big fan of heights, but it is, uh, it's a lot of fun. A lot of fun having done it. And then uh, later on in the 82nd, I went to jump master school, and that is just a great sense of, you know, responsibility. Mm -hmm. Being able to, you know, safely um, put people out of an aircraft is, uh, like I said, a great sense of responsibility. You take it very seriously, and um, yeah, that was that was good. Did that influence your uh, your legal practice at all? I mean, anything you learned well, there? Well, it or? does. It, uh, I think it did. Um, so it's one thing to be airborne, another one to actually go through the 82nd uh, jump mattress uh, course because uh, it has about a 30% pass rate. In fact, the first time I took it, um, I didn't pass. And the commanding general, uh, um, John Viper Vine, said, you know, you don't need to prove this to me or anybody else. I worked for General Vine three times. Um, so I had a very close, still have a very close relationship with him, but he said, yeah, you don't need to, to do this. On the other hand, and what I told him is that every leader in the 82nd, uh, E6 or above, um, if you're going to be a, you know, platoon sergeant, any leadership position, you have to go through the jump master, jump master school. Um, so if you really want to uh, be accepted, I think, as a leader, whether you're, you know, a, a lawyer or anything else, you... Uh, you do what everybody else has to do. Mm -hmm. So that sense of, you know, the creds that you get with the community that you end up providing, enabling legal advice to is, is important. Yeah, it was very, important. Very much, very much so. So walking the walk as well as doing the talking. Exactly. Yeah. So Bragg sounds like it was um, kind of a transitional place, uh, a lot of interesting new experiences and uh, doing some law that you, you really enjoyed and um, had long-lasting effects on the wildlife in the area, to a positive as opposed to the other way. Uh, what what then did you find yourself moving to? Or? Well, if you can say it uh, simplistically, the first, so I did 27 years total, uh, just short of 27 years. The first uh, half were litigation-oriented and the second half was all operational law-oriented. Uh, so law of armed conflict, international law focused. Um, and you know, what we train to do, particularly in the 82nd, is being a forced entry package. Um, and so that was working hand in glove with, um, with commanders about how you could lawfully do that, um, what the rules of engagement look like, and so that you can remain compliant with the law of armed conflict. That was incredibly satisfying stuff. Um, so while I didn't get to jump out of an airplane uh, in combat with the 82nd, we trained like we were going to every day. And the folks um, that I had the opportunity to serve with, both in my office, because I was there twice, offices I should say, and um, in the broader division, you know, I'm still in contact with a lot of them. It was just a great sense of camaraderie.
great sense of camaraderie. Now, you could name your mentor, but where was this mentor from? I mean, was just another legal person in the chain or someone else? Or? So, um, a lot of, a number of mentors. Um, you know, my oldest brother, I think I told you about, mm -hmm. um, he had the pleasure of having me, uh, having him promote me a couple times. Uh, actually pinned me, pinned my uh, butter bar on when I was commissioned. Uh, so I count him as a mentor. Um, I had uh, some great mentors in the JAG Corps. Um, General John Altenberg was a great guy. He was a guy who literally put his arm around me and said, yeah, hey, you need to go to Fort Bragg. Um, John Vines, a um, guy who you may not have heard about, um, but who's been in, who was in damn near every engagement from uh, Panama, Grenada, everywhere. By name, no, but he's a composite character in a bunch of movies. Mm -hmm. uh, I used to joke about that with him, but you know, who was going to play him in the movies? Um, he was probably the finest leader, quad leader I ever worked with, just a mm. rock solid, had a reputation of being a, you know, a guy who could chew nails, um, but, um, and he was incredibly, you know, physically uh, tough, mm -hmm. but, um, actually, he was quite a butterball. Um, he loved soldiers and taking care of soldiers. That was his highest priority. Wow. That's uh, the good kind of mentor to have. It is. You know, teaches you how to be a leader, too. Say again? Teaches you how to be a leader. It does. You know, it really puts does. Puts the priorities in the right order. No, that's cool. So what was the hardest thing about being a brag? I mean, you were reluctant initially. Uh, so, well, it was quite a diversion course, but truthfully, part of the uh, part of the concern was. Um, so my wife is African American. That's the American South. We didn't know if we were going to be, you know, accepted there. Hmm. Um, that was a real concern to us. You know, we had a uh, young child at the time, mm -hmm. and. I didn't, we didn't know if that was going to be, like I said, um, a, a problem. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> As it turns out, um, because it's such a large military community, and military is incredibly diverse and probably more accepting of diversity than damn near any walk in life writ large. There are always exceptions, but as it turned out, that was, no, not the least bit concerned. In fact, folks in the community um, were incredibly welcoming to us. Not just the military, but the, you know, the folks in the in the community at large. Hmm. Well, that's a pleasant surprise. It was. That's good. So your eighty um, second days wound down, and then what kinds of things? What what years were these, by the way? Um, so let me think. So uh, first time at Fort Bragg was nineteen ninety five. So Eighteenth uh, Airborne Corps ninety five ninety six. Fort Bragg, 96, 97, something like that. Then went to Leavenworth, Kansas as a student for uh, resident command general staff college. I stayed there for, we stayed there for two years. I was the first lawyer on the battle command training program. I don't know if you know anything about that, but um, basically it's uh, computer simulations from di um, brigade to joint task force level. Um, nobody gets a grade out of it other than the commander. And there are four, at the time there were four units that uh, rotated around for different types of units, different sizes of units. And um, in two years I was gone for um, probably a year of that completely uh, traveling. Um, did 19 exercises in Korea, a ton of exercises in Germany at the time. Uh, spent a load of time at Fort Hood, Texas, and at um, Fort Polk, Louisiana. For the that's where the Joint Readiness Training Center is. Um, and those latter two were for uh, training up units for that were going to what we call mission rehearsal exercises. Units going to Bosnia and Herzegovina. So 
uh, in Fort Hood also then at that time we were uh, the army is in a huge modernization moving from desert shield um, technology um, to advances even more advanced technology so these digital divisions uh, with interconnected uh, communication you know between uh, vehicles and units so it was going a lot that was a big lessons learned out of the Gulf War wasn't it the huge lesson piece. learned yeah. uh, so you think of the revolution in military affairs the Desert Shield Desert Storm was you know pre uh, pre worldwide precision strike and worldwide communication um, you know literally you know somebody here in Washington could talk to somebody in the sands of Saudi Arabia that's a revolution military affairs so you take those lessons you say well holy mackerel you know we're able to you know, defeat a, a modern army in 72 hours. Now you take the lessons learned from that and you improve upon it. Um, so that's what that was all about is, you know, training up for uh, that unique circumstance in Bosnia, but also, you know, how do you push the pedal to the metal on uh, further advances in technology uh, that, that you alone, um, as the, at that time, you know, the unipo unipolar power in the world has. So it sounds to me as a lawyer, you had an awfully wide range of experiences beyond just law when you're talking about this kind of uh, gaming and, and uh, planning and, and things like that. That's uh, very interesting. True. Um, yeah, I mean, that diversity of experience, I think, really, really paid off later. Um, mm -hmm. It really did. Um, after Fort Leavenworth, went back to the 82nd um, as the staff judge advocate, the Senior, le senior lawyer at the time. Um, and then at that time, 9-11 uh, occurred. In fact, um, I was in, back in Jumpmaster School um, in, the, in the circle, as we call it, uh, doing the um, inspection for, for jumpers before they get ready. You mm -hmm. have to do it in a particular fashion, in a particular time, and you get tested for it. And uh, we were doing that when my uh, sergeant major and my chief of justice actually came down and pulled me out of the course and said, have you seen what's going on in the course not? Um, and then we all thought that we were going to be immediately mobilized. In fact, uh, they stopped the course. It was the, it's the longest jumpmaster course ever in 82nd history because mm -hmm. they stopped the course for three weeks, uh, immediately rolled up to what they call the N plus two room, um, you know, got briefed by the commander. We got ready to go. Um, of course, we didn't go anywhere for a while. Um, I rotated out. Then, of course, they rotated. They were the first unit, uh, conventional army unit, if you will, um, into Af Afghanistan. Mm. Okay. The um, uh, Bosnian time frame. Um, you did war. You were on this this staff. Uh, Staff for the Battle Command Training yeah. Program, right? And um, you went to a couple places that were pretty hot at the time, Korea, those kinds of things. What experiences did you have? I mean, 19 exercises, you say? A lot. That's a lot of time there. It is a lot of time there. And um, that, was, uh, that was a great formative experience. Um, so lawyers didn't, don't get to go to um, uh, school for Advanced Military Studies, you know, the SAMs, the, you know, the Jedi Knight School. But I like to tell people uh, that was on-the-job training, because uh, if you really want to understand how, how the military works, how the Army works, then that's the place to do it, um, because you become so doctrinally sound. You're working with a group of, you know, 20 different um, observer controllers um, who are all incredibly proficient in their expertise, whether it's air defense, artillery, artillery, um, artillery, infantry, communications, you know, aviation, whatever it might be, as well as bringing in the other services as well. Um, so if you really want to understand what, what a uh, joint and combined uh, operation looks like, how it would be planned, and how it would be executed. So we tie back into, like the Korean ex experience, you tie back into, um, even at that time, really advanced um, simulations, uh, really advanced simulations about how the adversary would work and how we would respond and vice versa. Um, great experiences about the value of holding a high terrain, particularly in Korea. Mm -hmm. uh, great experiences about the value of being able to, to uh, 
catalyze forces. Um, yeah. Very cool. And just in simulations, and using Korea as an example, how deadly warfare can be. Um, North Korean adversary well known to use biological and chemical warfare. At that time they didn't have nuclear, now they do. Um, Seoul within our artillery range of the DMZ. Um, every war plan ended the same. Millions of people dead, literally millions of people dead. Um, the exercise usually, one part of the exercise of an exercise usually started with a non-combatant evacuation operation. Um, that resulted in millions of people dead, millions of people dead, and us unable to secure the exit of American citizens and our allies because you couldn't get them off the peninsula fast enough. Hmm. Yeah, it's great to wake up to every day. It is, yeah. yeah. So what about Bosnia? Was What was going on with you there and during that, that activity? So we trained up, actually, uh, for Bosnia before that, and we had um, <clears throat> units from the 82nd who rotated, and the lawyers who worked for me um, went out with these task forces. That was incredibly complex work, so combat, incredibly com uh, complex. But an operation like that with civilians in a, I'm going to say this, but a peacekeeping, yeah, it was a peacekeeping operation, even more complex. Control of uh, the civilian, keeping warring factions apart um, without being able to resort to combat is difficult. Mm -hmm. Anything unusual uh, from a legal perspective happened during that time with um, that conflict in particular, or driven by that conflict? Um, so some things we learned, lessons we learned there later came back, um, detention operations, you know, hugely important then, came back in the Iraq theater. Um, so some of those lessons learned there, maybe weren't as well learned, but yeah. Okay. Yeah, I guess a lot of people don't know kind of a lot about Bosnia. It wasn't something that, you know, the public really, I think, understood. No, and the fact that people didn't know that much about it meant that it worked really pretty well. We kept the warring factions apart. Mm -hmm. um, after tremendous blood set, bloodshed and uh, um, incredible brutality between you know, ethno-religious -re groups, mm -hmm. uh, the fact that it's still peaceful there, which of course that could change in a moment's notice still, uh, the fact that it's still peaceful there is a testament to, I think, you know, mission accomplished. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, Leavenworth, you left there. Went back to the 82nd, mm -hmm. trained up to deploy. 9-11 um, happened then. Um, 82nd left after I had, unfortunately, uh, had the PCS. I fought it tooth and nail, um, but went back to, uh, came back here to Washington and went to the Joint Staff. I was uh, one of the deputy legal counsel to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs. So that was 2000 to, is that right? No, 2002 to 2004. And um, at that time, the chairman's legal office, I think there were six of us then, uh, my portfolio included everything from a law of armed conflict, um, arms control treaties, and uh, pre-Iraq planning. Uh, so we did, at that time, Afghanistan was still going on, so we had everything to do with Afghanistan, most importantly, detention operations. Um, and then we put together, the director of the Joint Staff, um, as he said, realized that the NSC didn't have the wherewithal to do any planning for the certainly post-combat operations. So our focus was on uh, planning for combat, um, but then also focusing on what we, you know, phase three operations after combat is completed. What does, um, and we weren't allowed to say it until very late in the game, what does occupation look like? Uh, because the United States hasn't, hadn't 
uh, legally occupied a place since World War II. And if you remember those days, that was literally a word we couldn't use in planning uh, because it was so controversial. Um, but we knew that as a, um, as a legal matter, we were going to be the occupiers. And how were we going to conduct ourselves? We had to plan for that. Um, plan for that, how do I say this, even in a, even in a case where our political direction was told that we were not going to be there very long, uh, we knew better and we did our best, did our best to plan uh, for that. So what we call the PMC, the political military cell, or no, the IPMC, um, interagency political military cell, uh, was actually the Iraq Paul Mill cell that met uh, every, every day, usually in the evening, often twice a day, and that was representatives from state, treasury, certainly all of DOD, um, CIA, I'm trying to remember who else was there. That was led by uh, later Ambassador Crocker, uh, who I had the great pleasure of working for and with um, in Baghdad. Um, and um, the guy who later commanded MNCI um, as well. So we put together a plan. And uh, that was in probably the, maybe the busiest I've ever been. So you were in Iraq? Um, after the Joint Staff went to War College, and then where we studied nothing but Iraq, mm -hmm. um, and then went to um, be the staff judge advocate for multinational corps Iraq. Ambassador Crocker was there, of course, at the time. Actually, he was the senior diplomat at War College when I was there, and then later got to see him um, as the U.S. ambassador to Iraq. Those were the coalition uh, provisional authority days. He came in as the first or second actual real U.S. ambassador. Um, yeah, so MNCI I worked for uh, General Vines again, mm -hmm. and uh, we were the operational level command for the Iraq theater. So we had 160,000 troops at the time, and uh, headquarters, I don't know, maybe a couple thousand in the headquarters itself, I don't, I don't know what the numbers were. In my office we had, uh, 45, 50 uh, people um, mm -hmm. enlisted and, and officers. Hmm. So where were you staged? I mean, where were you quartered there? In uh, our actual headquarters was in Alpha Palace in Baghdad, just outside Baghdad, uh, next to uh, Baghdad International Airport. Uh, although I split offices, I had a, a very small office um, downtown at the uh, um, Embassy, which used to be one of the, uh, let me think, it was um, one of Saddam's son's palaces. I forget which one it was. Mm -hmm. So you get off the plane in Iraq. What's your first impression? It was hot, incredibly hot. Mm -hmm. um, so 2000, when I first got there, no, actually I visited one before. So when I was on the joint staff, we had gone there that was, so that was 2003, right after the invasion. We had gone there, I had gone there to help write the rules for the Iraqi High Tribunal. The Iraqis wanted to try, um, you know, the war criminal Saddam and you know, his uh, leaders around him. Um, so we went there to write the rules for it and to begin to gather evidence for that. So I was there for about a month, uh, about three weeks, shortly, shortly after the invasion. Um, and then I came back 2004, and at that point in time, it was still peaceful, where you could go around in thin skin Humvees. By the time I left, that was changing. So even while it's, we started to see at the first part of that, where there were IEDs planted, and then you know we took down every tree and um, you know denuded the, every roadway, uh, every. Um, line of communication so that you could travel safely. Um, and then at, towards the end, 2004, 2005, someplace in there is when we first saw the first EFP 
um, of course, uh, imported from Iran. Mm. So the the security environment had changed from you know pretty passive. People are pretty happy about having us there, not entirely happy, depending on who you were. Um, to then the security environment devolved actually pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> What was uh, working at that time in the country? Was power and water back? It depends on the area. It really depends on the area in the neighborhood. Um, Iraq is like a number of Middle Eastern company, uh, countries in that um, it's by neighborhood and almost by block. Um, blocks, you know, who has a generator and who doesn't have a generator. One of the great dissatisfactions was the inability to deliver essential services. So we came back later. That's actually one of the metrics we we followed greatly um, because there's a strong connection between this, you know, the civil service. You, as my boss at the time said, I never thought I'd love to, or never thought I'd say this, but I love bureaucrats because bureaucrats indicate that there's civil society and rule of law, and um, someplace in there, 2004, 2005, civil society broke down, and so did rule of law. Hmm. Yeah. Any other impressions from, from being in Iraq? Any scary stories? <coughs> stories? <clears throat> no, I, you know, certainly I did combat, you know, foot patrols with folks, um, but hey, that wasn't my job. Um, so. Um, I'm happy to say that uh, both tours there, so I did two tours of about 20 months uh, total. Um, all of my immediate crew came back um, uh, uninjured, you know, some indirect fire, stuff like that, but um, everyone's safe and sound. That was good. There was a great uh, attraction where people wanted to, you know, get off the FOB, as they say, the forward operating base, um, but unless there was real mission necessity. Um, that didn't happen. I I went back and forth with great regularity, particularly in the last tour where I was the staff judge advocate for multinational force Iraq. Um, I split the week between the downtown office, the embassy, both the old and then the new embassy we built, and the Al Fa um, Palace um, office. So MNFI worked for uh, uh, General Petraeus and General Odierno, and uh, I basically patterned their behavior, you know, wherever they went in country, um, wherever they went um, in Baghdad, that's that's where I, I went with them. General Petraeus um, <clears throat> in particular gave me a very wide gambit. Uh, what his expectations were were not to be strictly the legal advisor, but to be, um, you know, enabler of all things in all operations. Hmm. Interesting. So time marches on. Where did you after Iraq? Um, let me think. What did I do? I came back. Well, I went to the uh, Office of Secretary of Defense. I was the military assistant to the DoD General Counsel. Um, yeah, I left there on a. Uh, I left Baghdad on a Thursday. 400 days. I was there uh, 400 days. I left there on a Thursday and started work the following week. I don't know what day in uh, as the military assistant to the general counsel. How was that adjustment? Oh, that was extraordinarily hard. Um, so while I was there with MNFI, we did something in six months. We had a team of about it varied a little bit. We started with a very large team that scared the Iraqis. We ended up ended up with about a team of about eight, nine, ten of us who negotiated the transitional security agreement. Um, so think of that as a, a SOFA, Status of Forces Agreement. Normally that takes years of negotiation between two sovereign states. We did that in, depending on how you count it, six or eight months. And that was incredible effort, not only negotiating with the Iraqis, um, which 
quite frankly, I probably wasn't trained for, um, but I developed really good relations um, with the Iraqi interlocutors. Um, we had skillful State Department reps, two in particular. Um, so negotiating, uh, uh, going from a combat force to working, the key phrase was by, through, and with Iraqi forces was really difficult. Not only for the Iraqis, because we wanted to make sure that we protected, their big bargaining chip was they wanted to have jurisdiction over U.S. forces if anybody got in trouble. That was their, they were willing to, in fact, we had to, uh, we nearly came to collapse a couple different times over that. Um, but nonetheless, they, um, they, they bought the agreement um, without their jurisdictional control. But the other part of that was then going back from what we were negotiating um, at the national level. And these were, as we negotiated, we were checking back in with the NSC on a regular basis, um, two or three times a week at least, depending on how the negotiations were on particular portions of it. Um, so that meant that we were um, up really late at night to accommodate Washington's schedule uh, on VTCs and secure VTCs. Um, the other part of that that was hard was so you go from negotiating with the Iraqis and then essentially discussing this per um, uh, General Petraeus and General Odierno with the combat commanders in theater. And the security environment, this is post-surge, was still not very good at all, and EFPs were quite prevalent. Um, so trying to convince American commanders um, that they needed to be taking their foot off the pedal and working directly with Iraqi forces in a train and equip mission now, that they couldn't unilaterally con uh, conduct missions, um, was also uh, um, interesting. So. That was definitely a left pedal, right pedal operation. So coming back after that incredibly intense um, year plus and going straight into work, I was uh, physically and mentally exhausted. Hmm. I was back probably two months maybe, something like that, when they put together a blue ribbon what they call the Blue Ribbon Task Force on Detention in Afghanistan. So we went over there at the commander, uh, Afghanistan commander's request, um, a group of us, um, military officers, uh, civilians, academics, to go and look at how they were conducting detention operations in, in Afghanistan. And uh, that was a three or four week, three and a half week project there as well and writing a report about uh, what was going right and what was not going so well with detention operations there. Mm. So back to uh, DOD General Counsel's office. Um, I was there for a year and a half total, something like that. Maybe a year and a half, 18 months, two years, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and then the uh, position opened as the staff judge advocate at U.S. SOCOM. I interviewed for that and uh, went to SOCOM for a year as a geographic bachelor. Family stayed up here. Mm. Son was in high school at the time and uh, quite frankly they had had enough of, of moving and uh, so I was a geographic bachelor. I went back and forth between Tampa and here and a year doing that. That was um, that was enough. So I came back here. So you know a little bit about this. Um, SOCOM is everywhere. Um, essentially, I detailed myself to where we met at mm -hmm. National Counterintelligence Executive and retired from there and uh, went to ODNI. Okay. Wow. Yeah. I didn't realize I caught you exactly near the tail end, but. Uh, yeah. It's all good. It's all good. It was an interesting mission as well. <clears throat> so you reflect back on your career of nearly 27 years. Um, 
what stands out just overall? I mean, how do you look at it? Um, it wasn't really truly a great adventure. I didn't. I thought I was going to be in for you know four or five years, get a lot of trial experience, and do something different. The fact that I had the opportunity to work with just great people um, kept me in. Being a soldier is is uh, a virtuous calling, it really is, and I love being around soldiers. Um, certainly, soldiers I defended. Yeah, um, sometimes they were they were hard to defend. It's hard to defend a murderer, mm -hmm. but they're that one percent. They're the folks who raise their right hand, and they deserve a defense too. Mm -hmm. So I love being around those folks. Maybe not as much um, as I really enjoyed being around paratroopers and uh, really young, motivated soldiers and fantastic officers and non-commissioned officers. You know, like I said, the camaraderie, uh, the sense of esprit de corps that comes with that was uh, enervating. Really kept you young and uh, stimulating. Mm -hmm. Really is addictive. These videos um, may be reviewed by uh, researchers or people down the road from us, um, you know, into the future. Um, is there something about your service you'd like to tell future generations? Uh, the old adage about um, soldiers are the last people to advocate for war is pretty true because they actually get to live it. Um, Be wary of politicians who say things are going to be easy. Hmm. I assume you would encourage others now and in the future to uh, consider a career? Absolutely, and I have um, a number of times. Um, like I said, uh, being in service and being a soldier in particular, I think, is a, is a great calling. Um, I've encouraged others and I've helped other people um, get into the service, a number. And um, yeah, I would definitely do that again. I would continue to do it. So people think about you know combat as one thing, um, not perhaps pointing into the spear um, as a lawyer, but I like to think that I did some good. One of the things that uh, we did at um, MNFI was uh, the British deputy commander had in his uh, portfolio de detention operations. So we went around, literally all around the country, um, he and I, uh, John Cooper was his name, and uh, inspected Iraqi detention facilities and prisons, and they were horrific, horrific conditions. So I mentioned at some place, 2003, 2004, rule of law had completely gone asunder. And that was the example of that. Depending on what part of the country you're in, you're a Shia or Sunni, you took punishment out uh, on your neighbors. And one of the ways you did it was you threw them into horrific conditions. You know, an office this size, you, would, you could put 40 men in it. Um, they had to take turns standing or sitting. Um, you had to bribe the guard for food essentials, for anything. A hole in the hole in the floor took care of your body essentials. Um, it was horrific, and I like to think that that we had a, a role in at least at that time making people's lives better, because we would go back and quite frankly embarrass the Iraqi politicians um, who looked the other way with that and the local people who were in control. Um, so um, you can be a force for good, even in a circumstance like that. Hmm. Well put. Any last thoughts? No. 
if I was asked again, to, would I do it again? Yeah, I probably would. Um, you know, like I said, it was a heck of an adventure. Well put. Well, I want to thank you for taking the time to interview and also for your service. So thank you very much. Thank you, Bill.